Welcome, everyone. Uh, so once again, this is volumetric video and photogrammetry capture tips and tricks. This time I said it right instead of backwards. Um, and so we are going to talk a little bit about um, ModTech's version of it and some little intrinsics that are on that. And mostly it really is just best practices surrounding volumetric video and photogrammetry. Uh, and so from there, I'll go ahead and hop back over and to the next slide. And Alex, please take it away. I'm Alex Porter. I'm the CEO and founder of Montec Labs. Uh, this is our second startup in the tech space. We actually come from XR, uh, and this tool was originally created uh, when we were running Underminer Studios, uh, Tim and I. And ultimately, what we wanted to do was uh, create the opportunity for massively scalable content creation. And so what we have you know, come to after three and a half years of, of working on this tool is a highly scalable cloud SaaS solution. So I'm not gonna go too, do, too deep into that, but that's sort of the frame of reference of where we're coming from. My background is interior design and construction technology. And uh, across the last few years, we've worked in entertainment, media, medical tools, uh, and more. Um, and what we've always done is we've done that sort of back end tools creation so that these, um, you know, whether it's an AR scanning tool or whether it's a VR, uh, you know, wheelchair driving experience, there's an opportunity for folks to really, you know, build up and scale up their own interactions and contents uh, immersively in VFX uh, or elsewhere. Uh, we are a venture backed startup um, based in Austin, Texas. And over the last few years, uh, we have been awarded uh, top innovator awards by Intel. Uh, and the city of Austin uh, gave us an innovation award last year as well. From what I remember, uh, they're not doing innovator awards uh, this year, so we're, we're two years running <laughs> unopposed. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. Uh, so about me, I'm Tim Porter. I'm uh, founder and CTO at Montech Labs. Uh, I spent more than 15 years coming up on 20 years in the, uh, in the industry, uh, games and movies and video games. I was a technical artist in movies. I was a pipeline technical director. Um, and then, of course, now I'm a CTO. It's kind of a natural slide for me. Uh, I am uh, the XR standards uh, and vice chair of the working group actually that's flipped around. I am the chair of the working group uh, and the standards chair. Uh, so vice chair, yeah, it's the other way around. Um, wrote that wrong, it happens. That's how slides work. Uh, well, yeah, that is what it is. Um, and, and, and definitely where my uh, perspective comes from is is from the the maker side uh basically how do we make tools and things like that uh that can kind of reach everyone uh you know i am very fortunate in being able to pick up new technologies and then uh be able to use them in textual technical fashion very quickly um maybe not speak about it nearly as as uh, eloquently as i i would like today um but uh definitely the whole idea behind it is uh how do we help people um you know being a tech artist it's kind of a mixed bag of tricks my specific uh role was acting as an interdepartment liaison i did automated tools and toys for artists and then of course device specific optimization and all of those really kind of led into where mod is and where that is is uh being able to take the technology that is really really difficult to either build um, automate or, or or is very time consuming, and then uh, you know distilling that down into something that is is easy to use, quick, uh, and and doesn't require infrastructure, which is something that you know small and mid tier studios have a massive uh, issue with. And so, uh, for, with that, we will move on. So these are really, you know, our suggestions, uh, very similar to our talk earlier today. Um, we're gonna break it down into photogrammetry, scanning, and volumetric video um, for best capture practices. Yeah, and, and so, you know, photogrammetry, just a real light 101 uh, conversation-wise, uh, using photos, scanning. We're gonna talk uh, about RGB or RGBD data and LIDAR data. Uh, so we're talking about scanning uh, both structured, unstructured light um, and laser. Uh, and then volumetric video, uh, we're going to focus a little bit more on videogrammetry style of volumetric video, uh, since it is a bit more agnostic and um, and more widely known. Uh, so there we go. So for your photogrammetry rig setup, there are, you know, a few really important things, right? Camera placement is extremely important and camera focus is extremely important. 
Um, dependent upon, you know, your physical floor space, what you're trying to capture, um, the still object is placed typically in the center. If you have a, you know, multiple cameras, um, if you're using a single point and shoot, you're definitely going to want to use something like a tripod um, so that you can have a professional quality. You can have, you know, even um, photographs from every sort of angle and part that you're trying to capture. And then, of course, that will help you get even more detail. Um, you know, for extremely detailed objects, you need even more photos. Um, you always want to use, where possible, um, identical cameras and lenses. Um, there are some solutions that, uh, that can use multiple styles of cameras, but ultimately it's, it's a lot easier to solve if you have a singular type. Um, so the, the general, um, you know, way that we like to say it is a uh, 15 15 uh, degree section um, between each of the cameras. And that helps create um, those overlapping data points that you want to make that, you know, really high end asset at the end. Exactly. And, you know, this is just a, a you know, kind of light uh, concept when, when you're thinking about uh, any level of scanning. I've seen people do a lot more. Um, I've seen things get away with less. Uh, but, you know, general rule of thumb, especially if you're building a static rig, uh, is 15 degrees each direction, 14 and a half if you're really being super precise and you want to do something, uh, you know, super high in professional grade, especially like faces and things like that. Um, but really, once you get below that number, you start running into uh, just data that's not really needed. And a lot of systems that are, are newer will actually throw away that data. Um, <clears throat> It definitely, when you're talking about having individual assets, you know, you can go a, a little bit more uh, on the uh, topology and the flow of the asset if it's, if it's something that you have a handheld camera for, uh, you know, kind of follow the edges and go, okay, well, this is an overlapping area, so I need to get a couple extra in this area, uh, things like that, multiple rings uh, for your capture, but static rigs, uh, you know, you really are looking for, um, just a good average coverage uh, for each one of these different things. You know, when we're talking about uh, identical lenses and the reason why it's easier to solve is, you know, machine learning algorithms do go through uh, and they do an amount of understanding as to the camera's intrinsics uh, and extrinsics, uh, basically where it is in three dimensional space and the camera's field of view, a whole bunch of other uh, very heavy uh, uh, data points, uh, and it does that over an aggregation of the images. Uh, so the more images that you have, especially if you have all of them of the same, uh, number one, the calculation speed goes up. So the amount of time that you spend calculating that information goes down, right? Uh, and then as well, the quality goes higher because you have that same amount of technology, uh, capture information that goes throughout all of the different images as they go along. Uh, so it ends up creating a higher quality result. Yes, I've seen, you know, tons of different ones and a lot of professional uh, rigs use multiple things like that. But, you know, you're talking about rigs with typically 100 cameras, 200 cameras, uh, you know, and, and there really is no replacement for, you know, displacement on that. And so if you instead did something that was closer to single, you know, lenses and single cameras, uh, you know, you can get away with a little bit less for sure. Um, and then, of course, you always want to make sure that you pre-focus uh, your cameras and that the subject is in frame as much as possible and that you have overlap of the frame. You know, the general rule of thumb is three images per point. That's pretty, pretty typical. Yeah, so uh, some of the typical configurations um, are dome coverage. Um, that is obviously um, just around the subject in the middle. Um, and often um, if you're doing full body, you will see cylindrical um, styles of rig setup. And, you know, really it has a lot more to do with what you're capturing and what your physical footprint is. Um, so there are some ways to sort of use both of these to, to, their, uh, to your own benefit um, in different situations. Um, like Tim mentioned, you know, the three shots um, per each point is really important. We actually recently um, had had some folks uh, submit some photogrammetry that uh, there were massive white, there's massive white space. They were too far back from the object that they were capturing. 
And so when you have that, it actually, you're gonna miss a lot of the detail. You're gonna miss a lot of those really fine points that need to overlap. And so um, getting that object in frame as much as possible with the least amount of sort of extraneous stuff in the background or um, outside of the object is really important. Um, and then, you know, for each scene, um, you want to overlap by 40%. Um, and a lot of that has to do with, again, mapping those, those points of interest across all of the data. Yeah, and of course, it, these numbers are going to continue to update themselves. At one point in time, it was 60% and you wanted six images a piece. Now it's getting down to three, uh, you know, with things like view synthesis and stuff like that. Those numbers are going down on a regular basis. I mean, uh, I've seen view synthesis shots that can do a capture, full capture of an asset in under 30 images all the way around and it gets top bottom left like absolutely everything and the quality is just phenomenal crisp edges shine and sheen doesn't matter things like that you know but once we roll back let's talk about the today technology what everyone's using this is what you know goes on cues and people process with you know it's still it's three images right now 40% overlap, you can, you can get away with a little bit less if you have either really high interest points without a lot of what surface uh, uh, divisions, basically uh, a massive silhouette change. Uh, you know, if you have something, you know, like an earring or something like that, you're gonna need more, uh, more information that's in there, especially if it's an intricate earring, something like that versus like a stud uh, and different things like that. Um, so, you know, it really is that kind of balancing act between them. You know, if you have a, a static object with something that isn't like a very interesting shirt, you might end up needing more photos as well uh, to go ahead and, and actually uh, make the images end up, end up getting information based off of either it'll be lighting changes or a uh, shadow uh, pull or something like that, just kind of depending on what's going in there. So, you know, remember stark assets, things like that are very difficult uh, because it's really looking for interest points uh, to go ahead and map between them. Uh, so, you know, being able to shoot on like a white background is kind of difficult at times because then you end up getting, you know, either reflection or refraction bounce from the ground and, and things like that. Uh, you know, and the same if you're wearing just an all black shirt you can get good shots out of it we've done good shots out of you know all black shirts and things like that but it's just a more difficult solve just all in all and you'll get much cleaner results if you provide something you know maybe like this plaid um that's i don't know is it a is it a gigam or gondam i don't always forget what it's called um uh um but you know out of that you end up getting some stuff and then of course on the other end you know with a material like this, then you end up running into different issues like, uh, you know, making sure that the line stays straight and things like that. Just like, you know, anything that is camera safe, uh, but is still has some form to it uh, is, a, is a good answer there. Scanning. Uh, obviously, scanners are more of a, a continuous um, role, if you will, rather than individual um, images. And so, you know, the, the goal is to really, you know, maintain sort of the, the integrity and the level around. Um, so you wanna stay at the same angle and travel across the uh, object evenly. Um, and again, a tripod is required to have that stability and that professional quality. Um, there are you know, lots of um, ways that scanners are used. Um, LIDAR, um, drones, um, Ted's gonna talk some more about um, RGBD. Um, and then there is no focus required um, for a scanner specifically. Um, typically they have all those things intrinsically um, set up. And again, you wanna fill the frame as much as possible with the subject. Um, but one common thing that we are seeing is that combination of scanner data with photogrammetry. And so that's a really great way to supercharge your data sets. Yeah, definitely. I, you know, the one thing that you always want to pay attention to, you know, we'll, we'll talk RGBD first uh, and then go backwards to things like LIDAR and, and uh, you know, drone capturing scans. Um, RGBD, uh, you know, each and every one of these scanners has a min and a max distance. You kind of want to be in that sweet spot. Um, they will be, there will be, and there is physical charts uh, that are out there, like the, um, the, 435 uh, that comes from Intel, the RealSense camera, uh, you know, has a two foot distance uh, that's on that. Once you get outside of that, then you start losing quality. Once you get inside of that, 
uh, you start to end up having uh, packed information uh, that ends up causing issues with reconstruction. Uh, you can either get uh, issues with uh, warping uh, or, or the other thing that you get is uh, stippling uh, that comes across once you're too close. And of course, once you're too far away, it's, it's like a stippling, but it's more of a mountainous uh, spurious kind of uh, visual that comes out of it. Uh, so you end up having to be careful of that. Uh, LIDAR, uh, you know, if you're talking about ground-based LIDAR, obviously uh, most ground-based LIDAR is set up to go ahead and scan the way that it sets up. You know, Faro does a wonderful job at, you know, setting up their system so that they do what they do. Uh, if you're talking about plane based uh, scanning, obviously uh, make sure that you get uh, about a 20% to 30% overlap so that when the data comes back, uh, that it, you can use that to go ahead and clean up uh, as you're getting a flyby pass. Um, specifically drone technology, has really kind of come a long way with the fact that quadcopters can carry heavier and heavier assets. Um, so I'm starting to see a lot more data that is revolving around uh, photogrammetry, like Alex was saying, on top of uh, the scan data. And so you're seeing uh, a lot of a lot of time of flight scanners that are out there, um, and not nearly as many structured scanners that are on drones. Um, although I have seen some real skin, real skins, real sense. Uh, scanning drones uh, that are out there that mix that with a DSLR of sorts. Uh, and they provide some decent feedback. Uh, it kind of really depends on what you're going for. But once again, if you have to get a drone that close, it's kind of, you better have a really good pilot and this and that. And so there's, there's a lot of trade-offs in a lot of different areas uh, with this. Obviously, one of the better solutions, of course, is, is uh, sky-based uh, LIDAR with ground-based photogrammetry, for combining those two together uh, provides uh, both crisp edges that you receive from LIDAR and uh, a lot of the fill-in information that you get from photogrammetry that kind of, uh, you know, more like a prey and spray uh, kind of setup, especially when you have a large area that you need to cover uh, versus uh, the precision that just photogrammetry and uh, ground-based uh, LIDAR will end up giving you. Uh, so, you know, if you have big things, of course, the combination of the two does provide uh, more filled results uh, in a shorter amount of time, uh, more economical, things like that. So volumetric video rig setup. This is uh, interesting and fun. Um, you know, the typical model right now for much of the volumetric video capture is a dedicated stage. Uh, you know, uh, we, we believe that that is definitely, you know, a valuable way um, for some people to access it, um, but it may not be realistic for other folks. And so that is part of the reason that we actually uh, created our processing solution for ModTech um, was to create opportunity to bring volumetric video to other folks that already are doing photogrammetric capture. They already understand the tenets of this and they have equipment to do photogra photogrammetric capture. And all they really need to do is a few calibration tweaks to be able to actually capture volumetric video. So a lot of these things are relatively similar, similar to the photogrammetric capture um, with, with a few, you know, qualifiers here and there. Um, the minimum of three cameras per uh, 15 degree section, uh, that again is, you know, based on the tenets of photogrammetry, you know, call it videogrammetry, if you will. Um, we are absolutely working uh, to create that overlap in data and making sure that you get the most detail um, that you can, that you can to create that moving object. Um, so the camera focus, you really want the same focal length in each camera. Um, the same type of focus on each camera, no autofocus. Um, that definitely causes issues because all the cameras are going to do their own variations of autofocus. <laughs> and then it's harder to, uh, to create that end result where you're combining them. Uh, the global shutter, shutter is preferred uh, and no fisheye lenses. You don't really want to, to warp or have any of the cameras be uh, individual, if you will. Um, you want them all to have you know, the same settings and you can have all the same cameras, even better. Um, we have worked with everything from webcam rigs to DSLR rigs to bullet time rigs and actually, you know, creating opportunity to just recalibrate those styles and bring them in for this opportunity. Yeah, definitely. And I, I would definitely like to thank the audience for uh, their enjoyment of our infographics. Um, yeah, we definitely believe, and <clears throat> this goes throughout all of MOD. M MOD does very technical things to help 
either technical or semi-technical or non-technical people be able to do very technical things. Uh, so our infographics definitely speak to that. And, and there are a lot of things that just seem, you know, very much out of the realm and wheelhouse of, of a lot of people, but it's not true. Uh, all of these things can be boiled down to their simplest of parts and can be uh, uh, can be analogized, uh, put into analogies uh, towards current uh, capture types, uh, whether it comes cameras, uh, bullet time rigs, uh, photogrammetry, or, or anything like that. So, uh, thank you for uh, for your uh, enjoyment of our. And I will I will definitely tell uh, Niles, who is our our, our wonderful uh, marketing uh, art director uh, that he doesn't, uh, you have to enjoy this as well. Um, so back to obviously what we're talking about here is, uh, goes along the lines of, of why do we talk about three sections? It really is the vertical overlap. Uh, you end up having, you know, a, a kicker section, you have a mid section, uh, and then you have a facial section. You do want to go ahead and put at least a couple up over top. And this is something I tend to see in almost every client rig that we get um, that does really good jobs with photogrammetry is with photogrammetry, they don't really count on the top of the head really kind of coming out that good. Uh, they aren't that worried about it because a lot of them wear skull caps uh, and then they put the hair on afterwards. Well, I can tell you, if you believe that you have the manpower to go ahead and put hair onto every single frame of volumetric video, you, you go ahead and you do that. That sounds like uh, enjoyment well past the uh, level of entertainment that I find myself in on a regular basis. Um, you really do have to capture it now. It's all now or you're going to be in for a lot of pain later. Um, and so, you know, doing things over the uh, head, uh, making sure that you do count the floor. You know, I see this even with very large professional volumetric rings where they don't do a lot of work um, in getting that separation between the ground and people's feet. So you end up seeing these flat feet and you're like, uh, you know, I know not everybody wears a pair of Chuck Taylors. There is, you know, a sole on these things, uh, but they do go through and they chop off the bottom of the feet. So you end up having to have, you know, more on the ground that people really think that you should uh, so that you can go ahead and separate these individuals. It's a very important thing for us to do. Um, and, and one caveat when it comes to fisheye lenses, fisheye lenses are nasty. And the reason why they're nasty is because what they do is they actually stretch the image that are on the edges. Edges. Every camera does do this. Very true. Whether you realize it or not, the reason why we understand how far away a point is in three-dimensional space is because of the perturbment that a camera provides onto a flat image. So as you have this flat image, and then we get closer towards the centroid of the image, as it gets further out towards the edge, every single image has a stretching, even a prime lens has a certain amount of stretch that comes out, uh, you know, it's just stuck to that exact focal length and provides a much better result. Fisheye lenses do that at a much higher rate. And so what ends up happening out of this is that you end up losing more viable information, even if you do a wonderful de-warp, which I have seen some de-warps where your eye will not see a difference. I can promise you a computer vision, I will see every bit of minute difference that happens between each one of these images. And when it's trying to go around the entire circle, it will see those little bit of results and it'll provide a little over here versus a little over here. And that may seem like that's a, little, a lot or not a lot, but when you're talking about a little over here versus a little over here over every single frame, that makes the edges dance. and. Dancing edges make people nauseous and people don't like being nauseous. So this is something that we try not to do. There are a bunch of solutions that we are definitely working on on a regular basis that involve uh, machine learning algorithms that are obviously way smarter than the people that build them, i.e. me. Uh, so this is something that a lot of solutions will be coming out of and I've seen a whole bunch of good solutions here at Seagraph uh, that have come up with how do we deal with fisheye lenses because sometimes you only have the space for a fisheye. Fisheyes are really wonderful at getting coverage. The problem is the coverage that they provide is not the coverage that you want. So. And the rig coverage again is just really similar to photogrammetry. Uh, very typical, you know, dome coverage. You definitely want to make sure that you get the top of the head clearly. As Tim mentioned, you know, the, the feet and the head, if you're doing, uh, um, whether you're doing a full body or a bust, right? Obviously, you're not going to get feet for a bust um, unless you have feet ears. Um, but 
but uh, the top of the head is really important. Um, and there are some technologies, you know, we're, we're experimenting with, and we've actually created, uh, you know, temporal illusion um, to, to really recreate some missing data. We've had some data sets that did not have all of the ideal shots. Um, and that's not always going to be feasible, to be honest, depending upon what the subject is. And so having that correct amount of coverage is very important for that fidelity. Um, especially on the face if you're doing a bust, because the whole point of a face for volumetric video is to get all the macro and micro expressions, all of that flushing, all of the little fine lines, the minute movements of our face that make us human. So having cameras directed at all sides of the subject and making sure that you clearly get coverage for things like ears, things like, you know, hair and the top and the back of the head, all of those sort of really interesting, weird places that or a little hidden, if you will. Um, and the bus shots require uh, a minimum of 200 degree, 210 degrees of record data. Um, and so it's not a 180, um, even though we typically call it 180. Um, it's really 210 because you do want to get that back of the ear. That's a huge part of it. Well, and, that, and that's the biggest thing as well. Um, so you, you get 210 degrees, so you can chop it down to 180, uh, go back to our rule of three, you need to add an extra 15 degrees on either side, you know, call it at 210, uh, and then you end up getting the area that you need because you'll end up getting some warping and wobbling uh, based on the fact that those areas uh, only have one in certain points that are along there, or maybe two in certain other points, uh, just based on the right, left, uh, north, south of the 180 degree drop off that you actually need. Um, you know, in, when we're talking about, you know, cameras uh, on all sides of the subject, you know, it's just, it's the same it's photogrammetry, you know, you kind of want it going all the way around. Uh, cylinders do a really good job at this. Obviously, the biggest issue with cylinders is the concept that you have arms underneath and above and groin areas that are much further away under the bottom of them than there is from any camera point. So you end up seeing a lot of issues that are in those areas. Um, if you can do a full dome, you still kind of run in those issues. So a lot of things that I see, uh, which of course always involve more cameras, you know, when you get up to those 210 camera ranges, uh, is pointing upwards in certain areas. You know, you have some of them that point in that full centroid, uh, you know, uh, sorry, cylindrical. Uh, kind of pattern. And then you have these ones that point up under the arms and, and other problem shots uh, that are in there. And if you're smart about it, then you point everybody into a single direction. And then you get, you know, underarm and under groin shots and things like that, uh, so that you end up getting quality results. Um, you know, it's kind of a kind of a lot of fun, uh, you know, trying to figure this out uh, and really kind of get good quality results. Uh, and that's the reason why you see a lot of volumetric video where people are fairly yeah, you know, small spaces, yeah. things like that, you know. Well, the other the other way that we've actually um, combated this uh, internally here at Mod is we've actually created the, the opportunity to use the best of both worlds. So photogrammetry in an A pose or a T pose um, for the body itself. And then that body can be rigged. You can put mocap on it. There's a lot of cool things you can do at that point, of course. Um, all kinds of, uh, you know, animations or sequences. Um, you can map it to an actual motion capture suit capture um, and then volumetric for the bust um, and the other the other benefit there is that volumetric for the bust of course is a significantly smaller physical footprint and that gives you know the you the opportunity to to do that high fidelity facial capture and that high fidelity body capture and then create a combination technology that really maximizes your your output yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, and, and let's let's be honest, people know how to deal with mocap a lot better. And and with the way that we're doing uh, all in one uh, FBXs where all the assets in there at one time, it, it really is just a smart result uh, for for the for the output and for the use cases. So. OK, this, this is a very we're not going to go through this one by one. I know. It's a massive, massive amount. So. All of this is also found in our capture guide. This is really just sort of the overview, general best practices, right? And this pretty much goes across for almost all of them. Um, you know, your very 
some of them are a little bit better as you get into, you know, scanning, you're going to capture those thin objects better, uh, more effectively. Some of that shine and sheen is going to be less of a problem with, than it is with photogrammetry or volumetric video. Um, again, you know, on the camera specs, many of them are the same, right? If you can use the same camera, it's great. If you can minimize, you know, the, uh, the extraneous, you know, features, the fisheye and the autofocus and that kind of thing, the white balance, really just kind of try to keep them as sa the same across. Um, it's ideal. Um, one other difference between the way that uh, the capture data we intake uh, works is that our processing solution actually is most functional when you do not have a blue screen or a green screen or a white screen, white set behind you. Um, our, it works much more efficiently when we have points of data, points of interest behind and around the subject, whether it's photogrammetric or volumetric video. Um, we use machine learning and computer vision to actually do the camera calibration, to do the background extraction, the edge detection, all of the things um, intrinsic to understanding that, that trigonometry, the depth, um, and where the subject ends and the world begins. So, Definitely. Um, so one of the big things that people tend to miss often uh, is that they use bounce cards uh, for flat lighting. Um, and what you end up getting out of that are, are white um, reflections and refractions in human skin. Uh, so, you know, pa panel lighting is good as long as it's not too hot. Um, you can find some really good ones on Amazon, you know, a pair for like $50 or less now that, you know, on low end, we get really, really good results and they have battery packs in them and everything. And they, uh, you know, we, we like them. I've used them in a couple of shoots and they just, they're, they're great uh, for, you know, especially traveling around things like that. Um, DSLRs are really good um, in a lot of different areas. They, they do kind of have a limitation when it comes to volumetric video uh, and some of them can be quite loud uh, when you do individual image captures. Uh, although if you are switching them over to video, they still provide, you know, wonderful results. Um, you know, something that's kind of in the middle are things like RX zeros and things like that, uh, you know, because they are, they are specifically meant for small use uh, photos. So basically uh, anything minus a GoPro, because GoPros, you know, lenses are, are pretty, pretty rough, um, you know, being fisheye and whatnot. Um, uh, and then, of course, you know, we've covered this before, no autofocus, uh, you know, and then you definitely want to white balance your devices. Normally, uh, we do have a solution now uh, that automates and we have uh, with a Macbeth chart or sorry, um, a, uh, a color passport, uh, you know, there's 90 different a checker, uh, 90 different ways of, of saying this. Uh, we also have one that's coming out right now, which does a uh, uses a, a, a neural network to actually go ahead and, and create the same color tone across all the images. So if you if you provide a white balanced image that you want everything to look like that's in, in your list, then you can you can do that. And so you don't have to really worry about that. Uh, they do need to then be processed, of course, afterwards uh, in our systems. But, you know, you can do that also on your own. You know, it's just really kind of depends on where you're going uh, on that. But you definitely want your assets that go into processing to be white balance, that the quality is just, there's there's no replacement for that. And of course, uh, one thing that's not necessarily on here, but uh, is, is well known is is the use of, of raw. Um, in a lot of cases, you do get better results. Uh, in some cases you don't. Uh, and that really kind of just depends on, on how you're, you're doing that. Um, there you go. Yeah, I mean, we've alluded to a lot of this, um, but how do we fit in? Why does this, you know, why is this important to us? Um, it's important to us because we, you know, as I mentioned it earlier in the talk, um, capture is is not our specialty. We are very familiar with capture. We understand the best practices. We understand how to enable others to capture more effectively and to increase their capabilities. Um, but what we are is we're a processing solution. So we actually have distributed processing. So we are 98% faster in a lot of cases. Um, they're automated systems. So it's drag and drop of the imagery data into the project folder. Um, it uploads um, in an, on an encrypted you know, uh, system goes directly to our private secure cloud. We process to your specifications and we deliver it back to you. 
Um, and I, you know, I already spoke briefly about the universal input output. Um, really, the entire premise of this is just to open up the ecosystem and the capability for people to do more functional things without having to have the infrastructure, um, being able to minimize the, the, you know, very specialized staff that you have to have for a lot of these processes. And really just to, to drop like those, the overtime, massive overtime, like a lot of the things that we're doing and processing are those really manual time intensive tasks that are best served by a machine. Okay. Uh, so one of the questions that came up is, uh, do we have a REST API? We do have a REST API uh, that we are launching. Uh, we It is done, it just needs to, I don't wanna say be prettified. I, we gotta put rails on it once we you know give it out to users. Uh, and we do use a REST API for our internal testing currently. Uh, and then of course our, our website provides uh, through our, our, our Django forms to our REST API. So uh, we're, we're very far along in uh, the testing on that. Um, so that should come out shortly. Um, the, the biggest thing, uh, you know, on that is providing obviously the same quality of service across all the boards just to make sure everybody is is as happy um you know and of course going onto the website uh we have uh once you've upload or well once you've started a project you can actually see where it is in queue and things like that uh you know where what parts are processed what things are done things like that so it's not it's not all you know black boxed uh you you do have a feeling as to how things are going on uh, as well, so that way you're not you're not going well. Where is my stuff and what's being done and everything like that? Um, yeah. So we have another um, resource uh, aside from the capture guide uh, and our website. Um, if you scroll down on the home page, uh, the capture guide is available for you to download as a PDF. Um, we also have an Intel article that was published um, a couple of years ago now that really is a, a highly technical article it talks about costs benefits um and and more intrinsically just details around how to execute these this kind of um capture um you can find that at the link there um and we're always here as a resource um we really are interested in sharing our knowledge and and giving people more capabilities definitely uh and with that i'm gonna go and close this up to tell everybody thank you uh obviously we are montechlabs.com uh, Alex's email is, is alex at modtechlabs.com. It's, you know, difficult to remember. And mine's even worse. It's tim at modtechlabs.com. And we are with the code SIG20, uh, giving out $500 worth of free processing. So please go on our platform, uh, sign up and use that activation code, uh, and, uh, have a little fun, see what you like and, and see how you enjoy it. Uh, so thank you all very much. And once again, we're, for mod and uh Dustin, yeah. do you wanna do you wanna unmute and see if we have any live questions? We we do have questions. Do we want to do that as part of the video or do we want to stop recording? You can stop oh, recording. We did stop recording. He stopped recording. Still, I'll stop hearing. No, he didn't. Um, stop. We can stop recording and we can talk.